Really, come on. Does the we used to call them pink puffers and blue belt bloaters. We're not allowed to do that anymore. Uh, but there's the picture of the pink puffers and blue bloaters. Because oftentimes they're very thin, but they can be the other way. Um, so let me just, a few things. They may or may not have a lot of mucus production, but they will have a chronic cough. They will have shortness of breath that gets worse. Every day they have some shortness of breath, and that progresses. So that increases their effort to breathe, so we'll see the work of breathing. They tend to be a chest breather instead of an abdominal breather. So they breathe up here, which needs more muscles to breathe than if we breathe from our belly. Oftentimes they have weight loss, anorexia, the symptom, not the disease, so meaning they just don't feel like eating. The weight loss happens because they're working so hard to breathe, they're using up all of that energy and calories they can take in. Um, wheezes, sometimes crackles, all sorts of breath sound changes. Barrel chest, we talked about tripod position, that's what he's doing. First lip breathing, either we teach them to do it or they do it naturally. A use of accessory muscles, low O2, high CO2. Polycythemia, I think I <coughs> mentioned this. They tend to get a high hemoglobin and hematocrit because of hypoxia. So because they've had chronic hypoxia, their body says, maybe I just need more red blood cells. And so it produces more red blood cells, which leads them to look kind of ruddy. They can look kind of red because they have all these extra red blood cells. The problem with the extra red blood cells are they, they kind of sludge up the blood. And so they're not a great thing to have. And any time you see a high hemoglobin hematocrit, and we'll cover this again in message two, you got to think chronic lung disease. And it's the body compensating for that lack of oxygen. Clubbing, same thing. When we see clubbing, it's chronic hypoxia. The body has compensated. Complications for them, core pulmonale. Core pulmonale is really a fancy way of saying right heart failure. So you know what right-sided heart failure looks like? If you don't remember it, you should try. So if it backs up from the right, it backs up to where? The body. You get JVD and you get edema, that kind of stuff. It happens because the lungs are damaged, so the right heart can't <coughs> through the lungs, so everything backs up to the body. So it's kind of counterintuitive. In respiratory disease, we wouldn't have respiratory symptoms. You got respiratory symptoms already. Now you're going to get the right heart failure symptom. They can get acute exacerbations. They need to be treated with, you know, bronchodilators and oxygen and that kind of stuff. They can get um, uh, the core pulmonary is just treated like heart failure. Diuretic, like we treat it anyway. Acute respiratory failure, sometimes they need to be intubated, but sometimes that happens because, well, most of the time it happens because they wait too long to get treatment. They struggle along at home, struggle along, not realizing they're much worse, and then by the time they get to you, they're in respiratory failure. So if you intubate them, it's hard to get them off a ventilator. Depression and anxiety are common. Weight loss and muscle wasting, I already mentioned, are common. Cardiovascular problems are common because of the lung disease and the resulting inactivity and that kind of stuff. And diabetes and metabolic syndrome, actually very common with them. Probably the stress response would be my guess as to why they end up with that. Uh, things to do for them. Prevent it. Make them stop smoking if you can't do that, but encourage them to stop smoking. Um, properly treat upper respiratory infection because they're not going to have the reserve. They'll cause an exacerbation. And they absolutely need the flu vaccine and the pneumococcal vaccine. We already talked about that plenty. Drugs for them, a lot like what we talked about for asthma, bronchodilators, but more commonly atrovin because it's not as damaging a risky for the heart. Uh, certainly they will be given short-acting bronchodilators. Those are given to them to help them with exercise tolerance. If they're going to have to walk, they could take that as prevention. If they um, have trouble eating, they can use that short-acting bronchodilator right before they eat to make it easier for them to breathe so they can eat. Things like that. 
Uh, they almost always end up on a long acting with a combination drug and inhaled corticosteroids. Uh, and then there's this drug in particular that COP and that's Spirea. You've seen that advertised on TV. It's nice for COPD because it's once a day and since they're taking chronic meds forever, that's kind of helpful. Oxygen, we've talked plenty about this. Um, how you adjust it for a COPD, when you need to give it. Uh, a couple of things just to remind you. No smoking. You, oxygen supports combustion. So it doesn't cause the fire, but it'll support combustion. So it makes it risky. And when we talk about burn next quarter, you'll see patients who smoke and not burn. It really doesn't. It is not addicting. Oxygen, we become dependent on it, but it's not addicting. They're dependent because they're hypoxemic and they need it anyway. They can also use it during exercise, so they can exercise and should. They can travel with it. They just have to be more organized. They've got little tanks. they got to make sure there's a tank when they get to where they're going, but that doesn't mean they're at home forever and they can't do it. Acute care interventions for them. Uh, most of these are airway clearance techniques. These first two are breathing retraining. So the first lip breathing we've talked about, it prolongs exhalation, slows respiratory rate, it keeps the alveoli open, helps clear mucus, it ultimately does all those things. The diaphragmatic breathing, meaning teaching them to breathe from their abdomen instead of from their chest, is something they have to practice. But there's, there's techniques, like they can put a book on their abdomen and lay down and make sure the book rises with every breath. They're still practicing things they can do for that. Um, the rest of these airway clearance. So huff coughing, I think I mentioned that. It's where you teach them to go huff. They actually say the word huff as they try to cough. That forces expiration and actually creates a real cough instead of the <laughs> kind of thing. Chest physiotherapy. I did mention this uh, yesterday and want to be sure you get it here. Chest physiotherapy includes postural drainage, percussion, and vibration. What you do is bronchodilators first. So you open the airway <coughs> up to the bronchodilator. Then you do these techniques to help get the secretions out. So you got to have the airways open for it to work. So you open them up. The postural drainage is sitting in a variety of positions or laying that drain each segment, so all the different loads. This is really important with cystic fibrosis, but they also do it with chronic COPD. So this drains each lobe towards the big airways because part of the problem is it's all down the little areas that can't cough it up. So it drains it, and they do about five minutes in each position <coughs> two to four times a day, so five minutes. And with cystic fibrosis, this is very important. They have to do it every day to get it out. COPD, not as important, but cystic fibrosis definitely. You don't want to do it with meals. I said it will make you throw up. So either an hour before or three hours after is when they should do this. So they, they drain it out and they cough it up. Percussion and vibration can be done after postural drainage, so be sure you understand all this time frame stuff. But think about it logically. The bronchodilator opens up your airway. Then you drain to get it up in the airways. Then you do percussion or vibration or combination, which is this, um, to make the rest of that stuff come on up so you can cough it out. So you open the airways, you loosen it, and then you loosen it more to cough it. Other things is surgery. With COPD, they can have a lung volume reduction surgery where they just take out parts of those big floppy disease areas so you don't have so much hyperinflation, so much area you're trying to fill. <coughs> so that sometimes helps them. Bluectomy is removing again those big floppy <coughs> alveoli. It's a really big one. They're not doing a whole lot of good anyway, so you can take them out. And then lung transplant. You can transplant one lung, you can transplant two lungs. With CF, they sometimes have to do heart and lung. Well, with COPD, sometimes have to do heart and lung too. 
Make sure you understand these airway clearance devices. All three of these are airway clearance devices. Um, so continuing on really the techniques we're talking now, we're talking some little simple plastic kind of devices that have little valves in them that when they exhale through it creates vibration and it loosens the mucus. So there's a flutter mucus clearance device. Again, it just has this little thing in there that causes a vibration. Acapella is a little more fancy than the flutter. And then there's a Therapet. The Therapet, it somehow gives feedback back to the patient about their breathing. So, but all of them, the job is to loosen mucus so that you can get it out easier. This is the high frequency chest wall oscillation. Again, we use this a lot in, in CF. In fact, I've only seen it in CF, but apparently COPD is used. It's a vest. It just is over this. There's some really cute videos out there of kids with CF, and they just have their little vest on. It's vibrating constantly, and they're just playing doing their thing while their little vibrating vest is on. It's just normal to them. They have to do it every day. It helps get that nasty, thick, thick mucus out of our lungs. They cough it up. So that's that. Nutrition. Just think about this logically. You shouldn't have to memorize anything. If it's hard for me to eat because I'm having difficulty breathing, what can I do to make that easier? Use your bronchodilator before you eat. That's the most logical because my airways are going to be the most clear, easier for me to eat. If I can't eat enough because I work so hard to breathe, then I need supplements and I need high calorie, low volume because it's work to coordinate breathing and eating. So low volume but high calorie stuff. Um, rest before I eat. Eat small meals. Eat all day long. Just a bunch of little small things. This is kind of weird, but if you think about it, it makes sense. We don't want heavily textured foods that require a lot of chewing because that's just more work. And so we use more energy when we do that. Um, activity right before or after they eat might make it hard for them to eat because they, they have increased their work of breathing. But having some activity during the day can stimulate your, your appetite. So it's a balance. Um, the ice cream, just because it's high calorie, <coughs> fat, high carb, everything about it is high, but low volume, easy to eat. Fluid intake, they need lots of fluids to keep that secretion thinned out, but not with meals. If you have fluids with meals, that takes volume, and then you don't eat as much because it can fill you up. So with them, they need the calories, and the fluid's not going to have the calories. But outside of meal time. Okay, so let's just cover dairy and carbs. So dairy, we do think dairy sometimes makes you your slim a little thicker. It's not totally proven, so we don't really limit that. Where you sometimes see is carbs. I have seen this in English, which I don't test on it, but you could maybe see it, so you've heard it once. High carb, if you have a, if you have trouble breathing, you have a lot of acid in your body, because your CO2 is high. When you eat carbs, they break down into acids. So the theory, and it really is a theory, is that maybe having a lower carb diet for people with COPD might help them because they already are acidotic. No, it's just not totally a good problem. I've seen that in, in books. I really haven't seen anything. Yeah, All right, impaired breathing patterns. This is just reminding you things to do. So we've covered the difference between these. With impaired breathing pattern, doing personal breathing will change your rate, prolong your expiration. Uh, you don't want sedatives if you have impaired breathing patterns, so it slows you down too much potentially. Diet isn't really going to change breathing pattern. Oxygen, it only kind of changes breathing pattern. I mean, if you really have toxins, then having oxygen might clear your, your breathing pattern, but typically that's not the case. You need to deal with anxiety, pain, fever, and do breathing techniques to fix that. 
Ineffective airway clearance, all those chest PT, all that airway clearance stuff we talked about is important. The fluid intake, the acapella, flutter mucus divide, all that stuff is what's going to help with airway clearance. Impaired gas exchange, really all these things help with impaired gas exchange. It's what's their biggest problem. They don't cough well, they don't breathe deep enough, too much mucus, all of that will help, but oxygen is what they need and your goal has to always be something about oxygen. If you have impaired gas exchange, your goal has to be <coughs> O2 sap, 90% or whatever it is. Here's your home care. The only thing that's different about this and the other stuff we've talked about already is pulmonary rehab and exercise. Pulmonary rehab is a program and it involves teaching, diet, counseling, peer group, vocational rehab, like figuring out what job you can do with um, COPD. It's a big, long program. It takes weeks to do, and so it encompasses more than just the lungs. It's kind of total care for them. Exercise, they need still to exercise, but your focus is not on cardiac exercise. You know, so upper extremities, they can do things. If they have trouble with ADLs, they can sit in a chair. They can lean forward while they do them. We would like them to walk 15 to 20 minutes a day is where we want to get them. So that might start out with two or three minutes or five minutes and rest. And maybe the next day do a little more. So they're going to get a little shorter breath. But as long as they go back to baseline by resting for five minutes, they're fine. So, that is enough on COPD. Cystic fibrosis, we'll race through this actually because there's not a whole lot you need to know right now because you're going to cover it in detail, in peace, I hope. It is autosomal recessive. We almost always test on this, so let me give you the short and dirty. Both parents have to be carriers with the autosomal recessive, so you need two copies of that bad gene. Every single child they have has a 25% chance of having the disease. They have a 50% chance of being a carrier, and then another 25% chance of not having anything. Okay? Every single child. That's what she usually looked at. Is there going to be a risk to the mother's cousin? No, because you've got to have two parents carrying this. So if you need genetic testing, if you have a kid with cystic fibrosis or cystic fibrosis in your family, when you get married, you need genetic testing if you want to know that you might do that. Because if your spouse is a carrier and you may not know that history, you know you are and your spouse is, then you guys need to make some decisions. Because every child you have has that chance to get it. So we have a friend, his four kids, three cystic fibrosis. Bad cystic fibrosis. How awful to know that three of your kids are going to die before you do. Almost guaranteed. And they, they decided, they knew that risk with every pregnancy, and they chose to do that. There is a lot of gene therapy being done now. So I think his hope is there will be some treatment or as his kids get older. But for right now, all these things we talked about, COPD, they're doing them every day for three kids. And it's a full-time job. So it's very important to have genetic testing and think about it. They're both carriers. What are we going to do in terms of having a baby? Um, they tend to die of lung disease. They're almost always diagnosed as a child, usually at, at an infant. The average age is around five months. Um, and now the average life expectancy is 37. It used to be 20, 20 years ago. This is usually, it's more common in white, blonde-haired, blue-eyed kids. That's who gets it. Almost all of the CF kids are blonde-haired, blue-eyed. Uh, the patho. So I want you to understand it's not just a lung disease. Mucus is their problem. <coughs> Too much mucus production, it floods the organs. Um, there may be a path of question on the 
yes, again, look at your study guide. Because you can fuse it, it's not just lumps. This mucus is thick and sticky and nasty and it's everywhere, so it blocks the alveoli, but it also really blocks the pancreatic ducts. So they almost always get diabetes that is insulin dependent diabetes. Um, it's very hard to eliminate infection in them because they have all this gunk in their lungs all the time. So they actually have to come in periodically, you know, every six months or so, for we always call it a tune-up. They come in for a tune-up. They wouldn't be sick, but we would come in and really give them aggressive pulmonary toilet and aggressive PT and RT and get them nice and cleaned up just to keep them healthy. Uh, diabetes is very common. Liver, gallbladder, intestinal problems are very common. They're very skinny. They don't absorb fat. That's part of their disease. They have reproductive problems. They have trouble conceiving. They have trouble with infertility, both males and females. It's a big deal. Um, so all of their symptoms in kids, they're almost always born with meconium ileus. So when you do OB, you'll talk about that and impedes. That is a trigger that possibly they have cystic fibrosis. Now, not everybody has meconium ileus has that. But we're going to start watching for other things. They almost always are failure to thrive, that's FTP. They don't gain weight, they're skinny little things. They oftentimes have chronic respiratory illnesses. Uh, they have these nasty stools, big, frothy, oily, stinky uh, bowel movements. All of that comes together and you go, that sounds like a cystic fibrosis patient. Oftentimes when their parents kiss them, they say they taste salty. That's another symptom they'll ask about um, because they have a high level of chlorine in the body. Uh, low body mass index, skinny. Uh, the males are sterile. That doesn't mean they're impotent. That means they typically can't reproduce. They're infertile. Females have difficulty conceiving. They have delayed periods. Again, they have reproductive problems because of all this mucus they have throughout their body. Lots of complications. The biggest ones, diabetes, liver disease, um, not gaining weight. So what do we do if we think they have it? Uh, a sweat chloride test. My kids have actually had this done because they suspected one of my kids had Yes, We've had everything in our house in California. And then when they did one kid, they did both kids. So the sweat chloride test is diagnostic. If it's positive, if it's not positive, but you're still afraid, then you have genetic testing done. The problem with genetic testing is there's 1,700 mutations of CF. So genetic testing only tests for the most common ones. So it doesn't always diagnose either. So here's how the sweat chloride works. They put this little paper kind of thing on and this medicine polycarpine. And then they put an electric stimulator over it. It's just a little disc. Um, it doesn't hurt. It just gives a small electric current there, and it makes the arm sweat. You see it here for about five minutes, and then they collect the sweat, and then they test it. Um, and then they know if it's positive or not. What if they're positive, they will be put in a multidisciplinary team, like a GI doctor, if they have all these gut problems, intestinal problems. Uh, of course, a pulmonologist, RT, PT, a nurse, a social worker, because their whole life is going to be consumed with care. Um, and so our goals for them is to get that gunk out of their lungs. So we do that with a variety of things and all those airway clearance techniques we talked about, they have to have daily. They get infection in their lungs a lot. They get pseudomonas a lot which is hard to get rid of. So there is actually an aerosolized, like a nebulizer antibiotic. We don't use it for anybody else that I know of except the CF patients. Um, and then nutrition, huge problem for them. They do not absorb fat. So ADEK, the fat-soluble vitamins, they don't absorb, so you got to give it to them. They also do, do not have pancreatic enzymes that work properly. So pancreatic enzymes, what's important for you to know always about them is you have to take them every time you eat. Otherwise, you do, don't get nutrients from your food. So every time they eat, snacks, meal times, whatever, they take their pancreatic enzymes at the same time they eat. And that's true when we talk about it for other things. But CF is who uses them the most. So that's commonly tested. Supplements, they almost always need them because they're skinny and they don't 
anyway, so you gotta keep them supplemented. They often have them you know, two feet at night, they'll get a pet or two, they'll get two feet at night. Um, that's all for them. Oh, I guess lastly, bronchiectasis, there's so many things you need to know about it. It's just another COPD problem. Um, it can happen from a lot of things. Usually frequent infections kind of damage the lung. And so they can get all sorts of different breath sounds. They're hard to treat. It's just generally like a severe feel. I can't imagine. I'm not touching on my kids. I can't imagine. Other than hearing good songs for the future, I don't think you ever need them. <coughs> okay, that is all of respiratory.
Inhale, bronchodilator. Chest x-ray. Always, always the inhale, bronchodilator over anything else. Even the ivy cord for steroid, which is really helpful, but we want the bronchodilator. Um, no matter what else we do. What? That doesn't matter what order you put them in? No. Um, COPD, big thing for them is those airway clearance techniques. Airway clearance techniques and first lip breathing to keep those alveoli open, really important. Uh, tell me some signs of distress, respiratory distress. What's the first sign? Settle. Agitation, irritability, maybe a true change in level of consciousness, drowsy, confused, any of that. If you see that in anybody for any reason, the first thing you do is not do that because it's easy and quick to do. It could be other things, and that's the first thing. Now tell me some other signs of distress. Increased respiratory rate. Silent chest, that's really with the asthma. It's really just particular to them. What else? Use the accessory muscles, sinking in of the ribs, the chest, the sternum, the clavicle. What else? Simple, decrease O2 size, decrease CO2. Which is, which is more objective or worse? A SAO2 of 89% of PAO2 of 56. The PAO2 is going to be more objective than the SAO2. Um, that's how I want you to look at things. When you see answers and you've got it down to two and you're like, which one do I pick? Think about, is this truly a sign of distress or could this be something else? Like respiratory rate, well, that's not a good example. Um, just look at it, like the PAO2 versus an SAO2. Or occasional wheezes. Don't get freaked out about occasional wheezes. Continuous wheezing is a problem. Occasional wheezes may or may not be a big deal at all. Okay? That was with a few things. Alright, moving on to the next subject matter because it never I told somebody um, earlier today, or in the last couple of days, uh, with MedSurg 1, you know, we start out easy those first couple, now we've ramped it up. With cardiovascular respiratory, we're going to stay ramped. There's not a let's get easier at the end of the quarter for MedSurg 1 anymore, <coughs> and that's on purpose. <coughs> we don't want you to get in the easy mode because MedSurg 2 is going to start right out with cardiovascular probably. Um, dysrhythmias, all that stuff. So we want to keep you ramped up. So we have, we did cardiac, now our respiratory, now we're going to do neuro. And we have, we end with GI diabetes, which aren't as hard, but liver's kind of hard. So we're not ever going to go easy in MedSurg 1 at this point. We will at the end of MedSurg 2 go easy, because we know in MedSurg 2 you are burned out. MedSurg 2 quarter is the hard quarter, not because of MedSurg 2, well, that's part of it, but all your clinical hours. And right now, my students are done, and it is a long time to be done at six weeks in MedSurg 2. If they could just hold up one more week, things are going to get easier. So we put eye, ear, skin, and getting more MedSurg 1 than that. We put breast and female male reproductive and getting more MedSurg 1 than that. Those are all at the end of MedSurg 2 because that's where you can start to relax, okay? We are not going to get a break by the end of this quarter. So things don't go, oh, I'll just slack off at the end because then you're going to get a big surprise when you don't want to do that, all right? You can do this. Neuro is not hard, but there's quite a bit of information. Um, and, I mean, it's a little more in here. All right. So this was a reminder of, of anatomy fit. You do have to know the lobes for neuro. So that part of anatomy phys you need to know because symptoms help us know where damage occurred in the brain. So you do need to know some basics about the lobes, but as you can guess, I'm going to give you the quick and dirty. So first of all, I love these pictures because it's revolving.
find you where the loaves are. And so many times we see this, we never think about it in terms of the external body. So this is where <coughs> the various loaves are at. Occipital is in the back, frontal quite obviously is in the front. Temporal kind of sides and the parietal is the top. Um, and again, a different way to see it. So the frontal lobe, you need to remember one or two words about each of them. So for the frontal, it is judgment and problem solving. Judgment, reason, problem solving. There is a speech thing in there. I don't worry about that as much as I want you to think judgment and problem solving. The temporal lobe. The temporal lobe is integration of data. So we hear sounds, we see things. This puts it all together in the temporal lobe. And so it's it's not necessarily controlling hearing and speech, but it definitely affects your reception of all that. So speech language does kind of fall in here for that reason. The parietal is a sensory area, so that's touch, pressure, temp, pain, that kind of stuff. And then occipital is the easy one, sight. You can find the easy one. Now, circle of willis. Circle of willis regulates all the arteries in the brain. Think that's important? Yeah. It's kind of down near uh, the brain stem, which we already agreed is really important, I think. Oh, well, we haven't talked about that. It's another day class. Brain stem, you think that's important? Yeah, so the brainstem controls heart rate, it, it controls your respiratory rate, it uh, controls all sorts of things, involuntary things. So it sorts everything out that's coming in and out of the brain, and the brainstem kind of sits at the bottom, and that is the only opening in the skull. So when we have too much pressure in the brain, the cranium, this is what gets compressed, the brainstem, and it's really problematic. Like you die herniation if it goes down to and we'll cover that more in Metro Two. Uh, Metro Two, sorry. Um, other things in the brain. We have the hypothalamus, the thalamus, the amygdala. Those are all fairly important. The hypothalamus regulates a lot of autonomic responses like blood pressure and heart rate and temperature. So and it's near the pituitary, so it affects our hormone hormonal production. So the hypothalamus Sometimes we get a brain injury, we get a lot of weird symptoms. It's because we've got damage in the hypothalamus. It's our thermostat kind of controls it. Um, the cerebellum. When you think of the cerebellum, you should think of one word. Balance. Which means what would be an important nursing, inter uh, nursing diagnosis if you have a problem in your cerebellum? Risk for falls, risk for injury. So anytime you see a cerebellum problem, your first thought needs to go to safety and risk for injury. Neurotransmitters, acetylcholine and dopamine, we're going to talk about them as they relate to disease processes. So dopamine affects mood. We see a decrease when you have Parkinson's disease. Acetylcholine activates your muscles. It helps control how our muscles work. We see problems with Alzheimer's and myasthenia gravis. We'll cover all of those in detail, so you don't need to know the individual diseases yet. Just really a reminder of what those things do before we get to them. The PNS, this is a reminder of what's there. That's the spinal nerves, the cranial nerves, and the autonomic nervous system. The spinal nerves, we have sensory fibers and motor <coughs> fibers. So sometimes when we have damage in the spinal column, we won't have complete damage. So we might have sensation but not have motor function or vice versa, um, which makes things very confusing. Dermatomes and myotomes, we'll talk about that with spinal cord injury, which really we won't do until next quarter, but it helps us know where we might have function and where we might not based on those dermatomes. A and that are the cranial nerves. Here's the good news, you don't have to know them all again. I still remember on the old Olympic towering top of the Olympic <coughs> 23 years ago, 24 years ago. But I probably could list all the nerves, but I remember the rhyme. You don't have to know them. You don't have to know how to test them. Again, aren't you glad? 
So we're going to talk about a couple that are the most important. ANS, the autonomic nervous system, that's the sympathetic or the parasympathetic nervous system. What's really important about these is in spinal cord injuries, which again is next quarter. But in the spinal cord injury, SNS is stimulated in a certain area of the spinal column and the parasympathetic in another part. So if we have damage there, we sometimes cannot control blood pressure or heart rate. Enough that you might need a pacemaker, not because you have cardiac disease, but because you have spinal cord injury. So it can do really crazy things to blood pressure and heart rate that can be very dangerous when we talk about spinal cord injury and it's because of where this innervation happens. Which one, which one of these sympathetic or parasympathetic slows us down, slows the heart rate, slows the blood pressure? The para and the sympathetic increases everything. We, you guys know that. I ask that quite a bit. It will continue to be important to predict the spinal cord. There's those cranial nerves. If you had to pick one cranial nerve, and you don't have to remember the number right now, <coughs> what cranial nerve would you say is the most important in terms of safety for patients? The vagus, the glossopharyngeal vagus, we put them together, that's 9 and 10. Because of what? Swallowing and gag reflex. So that increases our risk of aspiration. So that's the one I expect you to always know because it's so potentially dangerous. The vertebral column, again, this becomes much more important in spinal cord injuries. So you may want to come back to it, although I covered it again. But remember, we have the cervical, thoracic, lumbar, and sacral, and we have seven, twelve, five. The easy way to remember, that's when you eat. Seven for breakfast, ten for lunch, five for dinner if you're an old person. Um, and then we have discs in between, and we'll talk about all of those. So spinal cord passes through all those vertebrae, that's how it's protected. And so we'll talk about all those in the all right, now assessment. This is where particularly we'll start testing for neuro is at the assessment. So we test cerebral function, cranial nerves, motor system, sensory, and reflexes, different thing, aspects of the neuro system we test. When you think cerebral function, you need to think mental status. So it, it's important that you know that the distinction. So mental status, we assess several ways. We have a mini mental status exam we can do. We can just look at your general appearance and, and your behavior. Are you agitated? Are you dressed appropriately for the weather? Are you clean and well kept? Those kinds of things. We can assess your cognition. There's tests for that. The mini mental status exam does that in a very simple set, sense, like do you remember these words, what does this word say, read this and do what it says, count backwards by sevens, it, it asks all those little things. Mood and affect, mood and affect are, does how you look um, go with what else we're seeing? So if you're telling me a joke and your face is completely flat, your affect doesn't match your mood. If you tell me you're super sad and you're smiling all the time and laughing, your affect and your mood don't match up. We talk a lot now about a flat affect where you just have no expression at, at all and that, that happens with some of our neurologic diseases. The cranial nerves, again, you don't have to test for those. <coughs> the motor system. The motor system, we're looking at balance and coordination and then Mo muscle weakness. So balance and coordination, again, is the cerebellum. So when we see cerebellar tests that are um, bad, then we need to worry about safety risk. Uh, weakness, pronator drift. This is pronator drift. Pronator drift is you have the patient put their arms out straight, hands up, which is supinate. Close their eyes, and then you watch to see if their arms up. If one drifts down, that's a positive pronator.
voluntary, rapid movement. It's important with some of the neuro diseases because if you have this all the time and you can't control it, it uses a lot of energy. And you need a bunch more calories. And I mean, socially, it's a problem. There's a lot of issues with Korea. And then this, Sonia, this means having a problem that doesn't work right. So dystonia is impairment of the muscle tone. The sensory sense, oh, balance and coordination. Romberg test is the main one. That's the Romberg test. You need to know what that is. The Romberg test is where you have them stand with their feet together and then they close their eyes. If they lose their balance when they do that, so what happens is you have them stand and then they, they start swaying. And they don't really realize they have that, so you have them do this test. They don't think they're having that problem. But when you close, they start swaying. That's a positive Romberg. That means they're at risk for falls because they have a balance problem. Um, the reason we do this and put their hands next to them is for safety. So when they close their eyes and then feet together, eyes closed, you just put your arms like that so that if they start swaying, you can give them a little support. It's not like you're going to catch them, but you would tell them to open their eyes at that point. Um, sensory. So we're testing for touch, pain, pin, and vibration with sensory testing. What's important is you understand how to do that. So which of those things would you, when are you going to test for pain? Very first or at the end of your test? the end, because if you do it at the beginning, they don't trust you anymore, and they're not going to let you finish this test if you do a painful thing. <coughs> so you touch, you do the others. If I'm going to say, do you feel this, do you feel this, do you feel this, do you feel this, what kind of things am I going to do? Uh, are your eyes going to be open or closed? Closed, because you can't be seeing what I'm doing, because they want to please you, by the way, so they don't want to fail this test. So they're not understanding that it's important for us to figure out what's going on. So they need to be real honest. They want to pass. And they want to please you. So you need to have it where they can't see what you're doing. Close your eyes. Do you say, do you, tell me if you feel this. And you do like this. Yeah, which finger I'm touching. And you got to do it in a random way. Would you say, does this feel sharp? Instead, you say, is, tell me each thing. Is it sharp, soft, cold, or hot? You don't want to leave them. So you got to be really careful. These things are all obvious until you're actually doing them. And then you or see the test question on it. So think about that you don't want to leave them with sensory tests. The reflexes, I figure you don't always <coughs> remember these rules. So two out of five is normal reflexes. So if you have four out of five, you're hyper-reflexive. If you have zero out of five, you don't have reflexes. So it's important to know 